Hey guys, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining. This is the Oracle Autonomous Database uh, Learning Lounge. I'm Marcos Enosivia, part of the product management team for Autonomous Database. And today we're going to have a very cool session on uh, basically the database vault, right? So that's built in uh, uh, to the uh, Oracle Autonomous Database. All you need to do is enable it, right? So for the agenda today, we're going to have the great Richard Evans. He's a senior principal product manager on the Oracle Database Security responsible for the Oracle database vault. And you guys are going to learn all about, you know, how you can actually separate, you know, uh, very critical data from even privileged users, right? And how to enable those things. Um, and then uh, you make sure that, you know, you're not getting uh, any trouble with uh, uh, even, uh, you know, admin uh, users, right? Moving data or removing data or accessing uh, data that you don't want to, or they don't need to, right? So um, we're going to have a, throughout uh, the session, uh, an open Q and A. At any point, if you guys have questions, make sure to type them into the chat, um, sorry, into the Q&A. Um, we're going to uh, share with you guys a post uh, in the chat. So we're going to share some links to you there. But we're going to answer the questions you guys type into the Q&A, okay? And we're going to have the uh, recording made available uh, probably in the next few days uh, in the, that link that you see there. For um, links, I'm going to share with you guys right now uh, in chat uh, a few of our most important links. And we have now a new page called the Get Started with Autonomous Database. Um, that's the QR code you see um, in the screen. And that will give you guys a, a, a very good perspective on all things autonomous, okay? And then you can join us uh, either, you know, have a LinkedIn or X um, there. Uh, and if you have questions, you might want to ask us on Stack Overflow, all right? All right, guys. Uh, again, really appreciate it. I am going to, uh, then without further ado, I'm going to pass the ball to Richard. Richard, thank you very much for joining uh, today. I'll stop sharing. I'll let you share your screen and uh, thanks again. All right. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Richard Evans. I'm a, a product manager of Oracle Database Security and I cover Database Vault as well as a lot of the other security products I can talk to them. So a little background about me. Um, I'm also known as Evil Rich. And uh, I like to think about how things can be taken apart or if I could use them for, you know, another another capability there too. So I uh, I was in the Air Force for four years as an Intel analyst. So maybe that's where I got some of my curiosity. And then a uh, contractor for a number of years as an Oracle DBA. I did some network vulnerability and pen testing against databases in the DOD I carried a pager for a number of years, too, as an operational DBA. So hopefully when I talk to you today, I talk to you with a level of experience and empathy, and I don't want to make your jobs any more difficult than they already are. Um, live in San Antonio, Texas, various certifications, degrees, all that stuff. Um, and uh, thanks for having me on today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys today about Oracle Database Vault and kind of what we can do with it. So we're going to divide this presentation into about five sections here. Since we've got so many folks that aren't very familiar with Database Vault, we're going to start with what it is. We'll talk about some use cases, move to autonomous database and a database vault together. And then I'll talk through a live lab that you can get your hands on and uh, experience and, and learn you know, all these different techniques that we've got between autonomous and database vault. And then we can wrap it up. So like Marcus said, I'll keep one eye hopefully on the Q&A. He can interrupt me at any point if we've got any questions on what I'm talking about at that moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, database vault is a control that's used to prevent unauthorized privileged users from accessing sensitive data or making unauthorized database changes. So it is an option that's built into the kernel of the database is on enterprise edition. And you know, one of the cool things about it with autonomous is that you already have it. It's already there. It's just needs to be configured, enabled, and the database restarted. Okay. So if you're a, a user of autonomous database today, you probably already have a license and it's probably already there ready to go for you to utilize. So, and then the other thing I wanna highlight on this slide as well is that we wanna enforce technical controls to go with our policies and procedures, okay? So a lot of times we say, well, the DBAs aren't supposed to do that or the system administrators aren't supposed to do that or the developers aren't supposed to be doing that. 
well, I don't want su supposed to be or not supposed to be. I want a technical control in the database that I can enforce to say they cannot utilize the application credentials and log in from their workstation or their laptop. I don't want database administrators creating new users or resetting passwords. We've got a team that does that. So I want to enforce that within the kernel of the database, autonomous database, on-prem database, wherever database vault is available. I want to enforce that and, and make those, those processes a technical control within the database, okay? Another way to kind of think about it is I want to allow my administrators to perform their activity and their tasks. What I don't necessarily want them to do is to access data there, right? Uh, as a recovering database administrator, I mean, I got a little curious at times, like, what's in this table? What's in that table? What's this do? What's that do, right? We all get a little curious. Um, unfortunately, it was just curiosity. It wasn't malicious activity, right? And so we want to make sure that we can control those two as well. Application usage, we want to make sure that we have authorized application usage there. So we can say, hey, the application connects from the application tier. You can't take that application username and password and connect from Rich's laptop, for example, right? We want to block that misuse or abuse of application credentials because those are one of the biggest threats to you, right? Um, as a recovering DBA, I remember working with some vendors who may have installed some of our software at different companies. And then three years later, they come back for an upgrade. Five years later, they come back for an upgrade. And the password to the application accounts are the same that they set three or five years ago, right? Because we didn't change them. We weren't sure where they were all embedded. We didn't want to take any downtime. We didn't want to risk breaking anything there. So we're like, the vendor was... Uh, I guess pleased and amused to see that that password was still the same thing that he'd set it to three years before, right? So let's, let's, we can do that. Uh, we can do that, but let's at least block that malicious or uh, misuse of that activity. Talked a little bit about enforcing the company IT processes. We say that, you know, we don't do deployments or changes during business hours. We say that we must use the, the CI CD pipeline. We must do this, we must do that. But those are all paper controls, right? We want to enforce that within the database because we want to limit the human errors and mistakes as much as possible. Um, one of my lovely war stories is always, I updated an index on a Monday morning at a financial institution and all the processes were, were collecting over the weekend and they were being, being run. And I forgot to include a global index clause that would update all the indexes and do all the things. So I, I locked that table for eight hours while that thing was rebuilt. The poor support team, the customer support team was getting phone call after phone call about why customers' transactions weren't showing up and you know where did their information go? Where did their money go? And it's like, no, no, it's all there. They're just a DBA who made a mistake and updated that index when he shouldn't have done it during business hours, right? It happens. It happens to everybody. We have the best intent. We get overworked. We get, you know, conf confused. We're in 10 different databases at the same time. We're rushing to try to get something done and we make mistakes. So we want to use Database Vault to make sure that we can do all the green activities and limit or prevent some of those red activities on the screen from, from happening within our database, okay? Um, Oracle Database Vault does this using uh, five-ish controls here. I grouped them in four and I'll kind of talk about them. Um, we've got realms and I'm gonna go into more detail in the next section. I just kind of want you to know the purpose of Database Vault and then those control factors that we can use here, okay? So realms are what we can use. Like I call them a bucket. We put objects in the bucket and we protect it. We put a lid on it, we lock it. So we can say that we want to protect everything in the HR schema and we want to keep, you know, admin out of it. We want to keep rich out of it. We want to keep our other DBAs out of it. We want to keep maybe some of our developers out of it if it's a production database. And so we can protect objects in that realm from every command. And one of the cool things about doing a realm is if a new table gets created, as far as maybe that deployment process, that table, that view, 
that procedure is automatically protected if we're protecting everything within that realm. Or we could say, well, we just really want to protect tables and views. Like we're okay with indexes being accessed. We're okay with procedures or, you know, uh, functions getting created or manipulated there. So we can do that, okay? A little more fine grain, a little more targeted are our command rules. So our command rules allow us to say, hey, you can't do a drop table. You can't do a truncate table. You can't do an alter index. And then we can apply a criteria to it to say, well, you could do it, but you must come from this server. You must come from this time. You must be using this user, some things like that. So we've got, we can enforce our, hey, you must deploy through this process, you know, what we want. So um, a little more fine grain there. And then the database has secure application roles or secure app roles. Database Vault kind of takes them to another level where they can say, well, even the DBA can't go in there and modify the criteria to enable that secure application role, unless I'm a DBA who's been granted permission to do that, okay? So we wanna make sure that we've got maybe some secure app roles here where we can enable things like a break glass. I never want you to have no access to that data, right? I want you to have controlled access to that data like we do with uh, root on Linux, like we do with administrator on Windows. We wanna say, well, there's a time and a place for you to utilize root and administrator. We use sudo, we use run as, same kind of thing you could implement with secure application roles where you could enable some additional uh, privileges for yourself if you're meeting that criteria. And then I, I lumped roles and authorizations together because they're, they're kind of cut from the same cloth. So database vault divides things into roles. And we'll talk about separation of duties, separation of responsibilities in this talk. And so you can have someone who can administer the realms and the command rules, and then somebody completely different that creates users or changes passwords or does things like that, or monitors the database or accesses the audit trail. So we can divide this up. And then authorizations are kind of the same thing. Like, hey, I know you're a DBA and I know you can perform a data pump export, but do you need to? Are you really authorized? It's a second level of control that we're implementing there on top of that, okay? So these factors, these controls, what's important to know here as well is that we're not replacing your existing privileges. You still grant system privileges. You still grant object privileges. It's just a, hold on a second, I know you have select on that table, but you're coming from an IP that would not normally select that, and we only allow this particular subnet to access that data. So it's a mandatory access control that we're putting on top of that discretionary access control. And I'm going to give you a, an analogy around home security to hopefully drive that home for you here, okay? So if we look at our house and we think about our database as a house, uh, there's many ways that you could enter the house, sneak in the back door, break the window and crawl through. Uh, as a homeowner, breaking a window sounds expensive at this point. Let's not do that, okay? There's only one person a year that we let climb down our chimney, right? And that's not me. That's not a malicious. That's not a curious user. We don't let them do that. What we really want them to do is to knock and come in through the front door. I want, I want to greet you at the front door and say, hey, welcome in. My house is your house. Grab a drink out of the fridge. Sit on the couch. Hey, I'll let you hold the remote. Make yourself at home in my house, right? So we consider that the front door. You're authorized, authenticated to come into my house, come into my database. And then I give you some privileges on what you can do. You can sit on my couch. You can get a drink out of my fridge. You can hold my remote. I might put some clauses around what you change the channel to, right? I might use database vault to control what you're watching, right? But I'm gonna let you hold that remote, okay? Back doors, windows, chimney, you know, we want those blocked by encryption. We want those blocked by access control at the operating system level. We don't want any of those side channel attacks to occur, okay? So let's think about this in terms of uh, when you come in my house, um, uh, when I come in my house, when you come in my house and I say, make yourself at home, that doesn't mean go through my jewelry, right? That doesn't mean look through my medicine cabinet, right? Same thing with a database. That doesn't mean that you should come in and look at the HR data or take that HR data with you. It doesn't mean that you should look at the CEO's salary. Although 
that would be kind of interesting, right? <laughs> Evil Rich wants to look at the CEO's salary, but Evil Rich should not look at the CEO's salary, okay? So we want to put some controls in place. So in our medicine cabinet, you know, like maybe I put a little bottle there that falls out when somebody opens it. And then I know like, oh, Marcus was sneaking around my medicine cabinet. I knew, I knew I couldn't trust that guy, you know? So we want to put those in place with database fault. That's what database fault does for you is it says, hey, you're in my house. You can sit on my couch, you know, drink my soda, hold the remote, but you're not going to put, uh, you know, uh, lifetime on my TV channel, right? You're not going to change it to, um, I'm not going to watch cricket. I might watch soccer, right? But I'm not going to watch cricket with you. <laughs> and then you're not going to go in my medicine cabinet. So if I've given you select any table within the database, that doesn't mean you're going to go select HR data. That doesn't mean you're going to go select the CEO financial data. I'm going to put some controls around that discretionary access I've given you with select table, select any table, create, drop, truncate, those kind of controls. Okay. So think about this. This is a layer on top of the database that's built into the kernel of the database. There's no agent. There's no additional, you know, thing you have to install or monitor or manage or upgrade. It's all a part of the kernel of the database, which is why database fault is so amazing, right? We want that built in as close to the data as we can get it, okay? Okay, so let's talk about some use cases when it comes to Oracle Database Vault. Um, the first one that I think is what we want to do is we want to prevent misuse or abuse of those privileged user credentials, admin, DBA, users with DBA role, or application accounts, right? We want to control you know, what they can do, how they can do it, where they can utilize those capabilities, right? Because mistakes happen, uh, credentials get stolen. One of the things that I really want to emphasize here is this is not like a, hey, the DBAs are bad and we don't trust them and you know, we need to keep an eye on them. This is a mutually beneficial situation here, right? If I had access to the entire payroll data and it get, shows up somewhere on the internet, you know, before Christmas here, who are they going to look at, right? Hey, man, I have full access to data. I would be one of the primary, you know, subjects, I guess, uh, suspects that you would look at. If we have database vault involved, we can say, look, you, you can't even access the data, right? So I could say, hey, boss, I don't know, man, but like my credentials don't let me access the data. I'm responsible for upgrades and patches and some performance tuning and you know, those type of things, I, I don't know, you know? Same thing with accidents or drive-bys, right? Like when we used to all work in a cubicle farm somewhere, somebody stopped by my desk and say, hey, Rich, I, I forgot my password, man. Can I buy you lunch or something and have you reset it? Well, I'm supposed to follow the process, but I like a free lunch as much as the next guy, right? So I'm getting a free lunch and I'm going to let, you know, or I'm going to reset, you know, Jacob's password for him, okay? So mutually beneficial here on what we're looking for. Uh, restricting changes to your production window. We've got a couple more slides where we talk about that, where again, evil rich or uh, uh, bad DBA rich, I guess. I'm not evil, I'm incompetent, incompetent rich makes the change to the indexes during business hours. Enforce that separation of duty where I'm not supposed to change the passwords. That's the security team. There's a whole process that they have and we want to enforce that in the database. And then get that high value alert data, that audit data that occurs, right? When that little thing falls out and I know Marcus has looked through my medicine cabinet, busted, right? Busted, I got him. So I want to get that data and I want to know 99 times out of 100, you know, 99 million times out of 100 million, it, it's probably nothing, right? It's probably nothing. It's probably something, a user we forgot, an application server we forgot, but we have insight and we can identify that someone tried to access the data that wasn't supposed to access it, okay? So let's dive in. Hey, Marcus, Excellent. And a, yeah. yeah, Richard, there's a great question here. That That's actually a, a good follow-up to what, what you had there. Yeah. Um, so she say, so we can deliver proactive posture. Can we conduct auditing and forensic analysis? Yeah, I mean, I think this would be a great, a great use for this, right? You've got your auditing already enabled with, uh, with autonomous database. 
And then Dele's fault kind of adds that additional layer of like, should should you really be utilizing those privileges there, right? And then one of the cool things about it is think about it as more of a security guard than just a closed circuit camera, right? The closed circuit camera is the auditing that records what happens. The security guard is database fault that says, hold on, let me check your badge before you come in, right? Or, hey, you can come in the building, but this is a restricted section. You, you don't have, there's a second key lock or there's another factor associated with that. So we, we know that Rich tried to badge into the super secret section and he was blocked. And then that audit goes off and says, ooh, why is Rich trying to badge into our super secret section, right? That's where that, that KFC recipe is or that Coke recipe, right? It's back behind that door and I have no need to uh, access that. More of a European audience, maybe. Maybe the uh, the Kentucky Fried Chicken and the uh, Coca-Cola sodas don't land as well, but uh, <laughs> the concept is there. So good question. Good question. Um, all right. Um, I want to push forward a little bit here because I think I've talked about a lot of this and I'm going to go through these slides a little bit faster because I want to move toward the autonomous and then the kind of the live lab that we have as well. Okay. Um, what... What we want is to prevent misuse of the privileged user, the DBA account, the application account. I should be responsible for backup and tuning. I can do explain plans. I can gather AWRs. I can I can uh, update statistics. I can do a lot of things. And then you can you can fine tune a little bit here, right? And then um, you know you go you can manage that. Okay. Um, there's another question here that I'll take real quick is will, will DV require a license when you are using OLS? Um, database vault uses some OLS, some Oracle label security capabilities, but there's no license required for it. And so unless you're creating your own label security policies, you don't need to license label security and device versa, right? So label security does not necessarily utilize database vault, but if you create realms or command rules or enable it, so the licensing is separate between those two. But if you're on autonomous and you're utilizing, you know, one of the many license factors we have there, you probably have it available to you on autonomous database already, okay? All right, so let's talk about this walkthrough where we could protect this data from one of our users. So whether it's sys or system or DBAs or admin in autonomous database, we've got a user here, Harry, who's gonna log in, use his web browser to get to our Glassfish, which is gonna connect to our backend application here, right? So behind the scenes, it uses HR, everybody kind of connects as their, their user, but really behind the scenes, they're using HR. Our DBA Debra manages this database, but what we really want to do is lock Debra out of this database, but still allow the application to function, right? Debra doesn't need to go query HR.employees. Debra needs to maintain the system and she should stay out. There's a different database administrator or application administrator who's responsible for that, right? You know, and you can still utilize that HR account to log in maybe. So if I'm thinking as Evil Rich, like, well, if I've got the password to HR, I don't need my DBA account, right? And so we'll talk about kind of how to lock that down as we get going here. But one of the things I really like about Database Vault in a, in a more recent version, uh, what was it, 12.2 or something? So I guess it's been a while now. We implemented what's called simulation mode. So again, I don't want to stop your work activities and I don't want to be the reason that you you have an outage or you're getting you know phone calls on a Monday morning like I was because something broke start in simulation mode right just simulate the enforcement of this realm and identify where they're coming from and who's using this and this kind of goes toward that forensic idea here right like let's create a an environment where we know our data usage patterns and then we can identify that okay we've got everybody, and all the monthly processes, maybe the quarterly processes that run, they're going to access this data. And then we allow them to access the realm and access that data there. Okay. So simulation mode is great for rule, for command rules and for realms to protect and uh, to identify what's going on there. Okay. Uh, limit access to sensitive data. Again, 
for thinking about that HR user and those stolen credentials. Hey man, I don't want um I don't want that that contractor who installed my application to come back in three years and go, hey, look, the password still works, right? Like that's <laughs> that's not good. If we don't change the password, at least we don't want him to be able to do that from our from his laptop that he logs in with, right? We want to control that. Okay. So taking that same scenario here with our HR Harry using his web browser, logging into the application. In my instance, it's a Glassfish application. Could be Apex, could be Java. It doesn't matter what the application is. What we're doing is we're protecting the database. And if we skip through here, we've protected the database from our privileged user. The application still functions. And then we've realized, oh, that HR user, those credentials could be stolen. And that's really the biggest threat, right? Like we we love to talk about zero days and we love to talk about all these fancy exploits. At the end of the day, man, if I can get credentials to a database or to a, a an, an application, that's what I want. I want to be able to log into it and blend in and look like I'm doing normal activity. And I want to exfiltrate that data. So what we want to do is we want to say, well, HR can only access this data if they meet our rule set, right? So I'll go back and forth here a couple of times so you can see the change. There's this bright red arrow I stuck on there next to trust app server. That's a rule set that I applied to HR as an authorized user and said, hey, I know you own the application and I know you have access to all the data, but before you go in my medicine cabinet, right? I'm gonna check to see if you meet the criteria. Did I say, go get the aspirin out of my medicine cabinet, right? I want to control where HR can utilize those credentials. And one of the cool things about the Oracle database, the JWC drivers, the, you know, the OCI drivers, things like that is the database knows, you know, hey, what's the IP you're connected from? What's the host name? Uh, what time of day is it? What program are you using? What module are you in? What's the OS user you're connecting from? You can take all of this context, this system context, and apply it and create these rule sets. So kind of the sky's the limit for you when you decide, hey, I want this access pattern, right? You could do subnets, you could do ciders, you could do IPs, you could do, hey, you must have this role enabled, or you must have this custom context. There's all sorts of cool things. And again, before you enforce it, put it in simulation mode and make sure that you are comfortable with the rules and the logic you've created, right? We don't want to cause any outages. We don't want to break anything. We want to identify usage patterns and then say, okay, this is the proper usage pattern. This is what our procedures say. This is what our processes say. This is what we're going to enforce with technical controls. Okay. Um, malicious users, right? Um, if I can't if I can't steal data, then I'm going to try to destroy it. That's a common access pattern for a lot of folks. Uh, a lot of malicious activity is if I can't encrypt it, if I can't access it, can I destroy it, right? We kind of go through that process. So Data's Vault can say, hey, maybe we don't do drop tables from application servers ever, right? Drop tables only come from our jump servers, our bastion servers, our deployment servers, our CICD pipeline those things are where that activity should take place. So we're going to enforce that with a command rule that says drop table only comes from these IPs or these hosts, or it must be local to the database. All sorts of cool things you can do there with, with that. So let's do it. Let's expand upon our environment here. So we've got our database fault. We've got our rule set in place to limit how that HR user can connect. We add an additional component here, a control with our command rule where we say, hey, we're protecting drop table. We want to authorize HR to do it. And we can do it from maybe that trusted app server or something there, right? Or maybe we say that should say trusted jump server instead, right? We don't necessarily want the app to be able to drop it. We want the jump servers or the deployment servers to be able to drop it there. Okay. Again, start in simulation mode understand what's going on, that access pattern, and then you can say, okay, yep, I'm comfortable with the way we've done this. Okay. Uh, this is me. This slide is specific for me. Um, creating a, an outage during business hours, <laughs> right? We want to say that maybe database vault rules 
extract the hour and between six and eight, 1800, you can do certain things. Maybe between six and 1800, you cannot do certain things, right? Maybe the access pattern says that only during business hours, you should access this data. Or maybe the access pattern is, hey, maintenance happens during maintenance windows. And so we want to allow that to occur during maintenance windows there, okay? You know, you can apply this to all, pretty much all of the DDL, DML type of commands, either in combination with a realm or on its own outside of a realm. So if you don't want to create the realm, you could just say, well, I want to protect, you know, mistakes first, truncate, drop, uh, drop user, things like that, okay? And then separation of duty. Everybody has a separation of duty requirement, whether it's a company mandate, whether it's an industry mandate, whether it's a regulatory, a federal, a state, a local mandate that we have there is we can enforce this within the database to kind of say, look, I don't create users. I'm a database administrator. I manage databases. I don't know who should access the data, right? And a lot of times we put that on DBAs, right? We say, like, it's it's it was my my responsibility to raise my hand and say, like, Barb, Barbara doesn't access this data normally. Like, why am I creating an account for her in this database? And then the the ticket, the you know, the 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 customer request was like, oh, well, I just put all the databases that I knew in there, or I just said grant all access, make them look like this. Well, yeah, there's some things there that maybe Bill has that Barbara doesn't need to have, right? So let's enforce that separation of duty for users, for administrators, for applications as well, and how they should access the database there, okay? Now let's get to this uh, actionable alerts. We've kind of talked about this here as well is auditing is great. Auditing is necessary. Auditing is something you have to do. Please do something with that data though, right? I can't tell you how many customers I talk to and I say, do you audit your database activity? Oh yeah, we audit it. What do you do with it? What do you mean? Where does it go? Oh, it goes to a table. Well, I know that, but from there, what do you do with it? Well, it gets backed up and if something happens, we look at it. Okay. <laughs> let's, 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 let's create some actionable, you know, something we can do with this, right? It's just, it's just raw data. Let's turn this into something that we can get alerts on. We can get notified. We can understand access patterns. So what I would say is with Autonomous Database, the first thing you should do is integrate your Autonomous Database with Oracle DataSafe. And I'll talk about that a little bit here later. And then you should get this audit data in there. So at least you can see it. So at least you can get some alerts. So at least you can identify maybe what's going on in the environment there, right? Um, yeah, I can't tell you how many times I just would truncate an audit table after a while because the security team would never never come and get it, you know? So, all right. So one of the things I, I really like about Autonomous Database and Database Vault is Autonomous has done so much of the work for you. You remember when we used to have to requisition hardware and we used to have to rack them or have somebody rack them? And then we, I remember spending weeks thinking about my RAID configuration on my son's storage servers and oh do I do this do I do that and then you know then I get the the OS installed and I get the networking team involved and I install my database and by the time I've done all those kind of basic fundamental things I'm weeks behind on my project and I've got to get this thing out right like I've got to get this database out there for folks to use uh, I haven't done encryption at rest I haven't done encryption in motion I haven't really identified privileged users and how I want to control them and what kind of access I want um I want to make sure that I can do all of this uh, without thinking about it and before I get bogged down, right? Autonomous Database does this for you. Secure by default. We don't access the operating system. Customers, we've limited the users. Up-to-date security patches and profiles and things there. So I don't have to think about that vulnerability from a year ago that my database is still not patched for, right? We want to make sure we're staying current on patches. End-to-end -end encryption, encryption at motion, encryption at rest. It's all taken care of for me. Auditing is always on. I got at least a basic fundamental level of what's happening there with auditing in my environment. And then all the things on the right side that the cloud does that I'm not very good at, right? That compartmentalization, identity access management, access control lists, infrastructure network isolation, all the cool stuff that you can do that's already there, right? 
this is where we add database vault on top of it too, okay? Uh, the follow-up here was competition such as Microsoft. To my knowledge, there is not another RDBMS vendor that has the capabilities that database vault has, right? There are similar solutions where it's row level control or it's a uh, uh, role based access controls, but the privileged users in virtually every other database can access the data, right? Database Vault says, no, no, you're a DBA responsible for this. Let's control access to that HR schema. So as far as relational databases go, no, no, Database Vault is in a class of its own. Okay. Good questions. All right, if we're gonna get started with database vault on autonomous serverless, we're gonna start with one command. This command is gonna be dbms cloud mac adam, which is mandatory, mandatory access control administrator. And we're gonna configure database vault and we're gonna provide it two accounts to start with, okay? One is that database vault owner that creates those realms, those command rules. The other is the account manager that creates users that resets passwords. If this in your organization is one person, if this is rich, that's okay. You can give rich the privileges to do both of those things. Data Vault is not gonna force you to work in a particular way. It's gonna break it out initially and then allow you to kind of say, okay, well, realistically, rich does this, this, and this. Let's give him those privileges, right? You decide kind of how you want to work with Data Vault and what those controls look like within your environment, okay? I always recommend you create at least two users for each of these roles, right? We wanna make sure that we've got redundancy, put those into vault, put those in some kind of a solution where you've got a backup of those. Don't lose the passwords, right? Um, make sure that you've got access. Um, give it with admin options so they can grant to other users if they need to as well, okay? Step two, enable it. This step is typically something you would do as like our ADB DV owner user, which I created in, or I, I identified in step one is the database vault owner. In autonomous, you can do this as admin and we'll talk about admin in step here. Um, we wanna make sure that we enable it and then maybe we, we stop what admin can do as far as accessing that database, okay? Um, the question that just came in is a really good one. It's like, okay, so if I'm doing all this work, Rich, does database vault get to access the data? No, 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 right? Separation of responsibilities. Database vault owner does not have select any table. It doesn't have that ability to go at your HR data, your financial data. Its sole responsibility is enabling and disabling and then creating realms, creating, uh, creating command rules, creating rules, rule sets, factors, those type of things. So its responsibility is managing that metadata that protects that HR or financial data for you, okay? And then it's a good segue to step three, which is restart that database. So we even have separation of responsibility there where look, database vault owner can separate, can enable or disable it, but it won't take effect until an administrator restarts that database, right? So we've got that separation of responsibility there as well, okay? Um, I would probably say with admin, please stop using that admin account in cloud. It even warns you like, hey, you're using admin, you should create a named account. You can revoke DV owner, DV account manager from admin, or you can simply lock that account and not use it there, okay? Uh, a couple of good questions just came in here. Is the security officer must be the one creating David's vault rules and configurations? If admin is enabled and assigned this role to a specific user, uh, good question. Out of the box, admin has that capability to create realms, create rules, create all the stuff. But you can lock that account. You can revoke those roles from that user. If you want to grant multiple users, uh, I'm sorry, multiple roles to the same user, you can do that. So if you have a separate security team that you want to do this, by all means, give them these roles. If you don't have a separate security team, you're like, Rich, man, we're in the cloud now, dude. We're full stack developers, DBAs, everything. We're full stack everything. So, okay, identify a person or a team to give that responsibility to, okay? So you can decide how siloed you want to be within your organization with these roles and responsibilities, okay? Kind of on the same vein here, the other question is, 
admin user by default has no roles. No, um, by default, admin has these roles. So like step one, I can I conduct is admin, I configure it, which I would have done as sys on-prem. Step two can be conducted, can be uh, run by either my ADB DV owner user that I've created or in autonomous, it could be run as admin, right? Admin is kind of the root of everything, which is why we've got the warnings to say, hey, don't use admin on a daily basis. You can lock admin from the UI as well. So you use that, or you could revoke these privileges from admin if you wanted to. But my recommendation is don't use admin, right? Create your named accounts or integrate with OCI, IAM, or Azure Active Directory, or, you know, Kerberos. You can do Kerberos authentication as CMU, centrally managed users as well with Autonomous. Do that and don't use admin. It's like using system. It's like using sys. It's it's a just a generic account that we have no attribution of who did what with it there. Okay. All right. Um. I'm gonna click through this next slide here and basically just say everything that we talked about already, you can do with autonomous database and database vault. So we can do all of these use cases that we covered today. And I wanna to talk to you about a live lab that we have out there called uh, securing a legacy application using Oracle database vault on autonomous. And I'm gonna paste this link into the chat here. Let's see if I can do this successfully. Okay, so this is a lab that you would run on your tenancy, um, you can, you can, what it does is it, it kind of, it kind of replicates, it kind of shows like, hey, we've got an on-prem application. We want to move it to autonomous. We want to take advantage of that secure by default, the patching, the encryption at rest, encryption at motion, the auditing, everything that autonomous offers. And we want to bring our compute image of our Glassfish app or Java application or whatever it is up to the cloud. And so we want to install it there, okay? So we load the data. In my example, I just run a script, we load it. You could do data migrations, you can do Golden Gate, you can do all sorts of cool things with OCI that you would use to get your production data up there. And then we would connect to that Glassfish application using, uh, we would connect the Glassfish application to Autonomous using let's say one-way TLS. You could use mutual TLS if you prefer, but at the very least we are encrypting that connection from the app from the application to the database, okay? One of the things I love about this Glassfish application and we use it in a bunch of our different labs is this thing is so vulnerable. <laughs> you can do SQL injections against it. It's running a really old version of Glassfish. Like it's very weak and it's very weak on purpose because we wanna show you that we're not gonna modify the application. I'm not a developer. I want to put the controls around it to encrypt the data at rest, encrypt the data in motion, limit where that HR user could authenticate from, uh, control access from privileged users. I can put all these controls around that application. So no matter how old it is, we want to go ahead and try to protect it. Okay. In this lab, we use it to use database fault. We create a realm in that simulation mode I was talking about. And then we, we identify that access pattern for a while and we say, okay, database vault can be enabled. And then we just verify that we've got it working there and it's all good, okay? So let's walk through this. Same thing we've talked about already, just in the cloud, right? Like this lab walks you through doing all of this, right? We've got that capability there. And then what we can also do with this is like, let's say, let's say um, the, the commands that we would utilize are, I've given them names here. So I've stuck in my security admin Owen or my uh, ace, my account admin ace. You know, you could put your your usernames in there. You could create a generic one and then grant yourself roles and stuff. But again, same things, we do that. And then when we want to create this realm, I'm just giving it this, uh, this simple little DBMS Mac administrator command creating the realm. And I'm telling it started in simulation mode, right? I wanna start in simulation mode. And then I want to audit, I want to add to my bucket the objects I want to protect. I want to protect everything the employee search schema owns. So like my HR schema, or my finance schema, whatever schema it is, I want to protect all existing and future ob objects with this realm, okay? And then 
I'm just going to watch it for a while. I'm just going to let it work, let the application function, let the users work. Then I'm going to go to my simulation log. I'm going to see what were the violations of that. I don't care about the, the access. If they were supposed to access it, that's okay. That's not my concern. But in this case, I haven't given anybody specific access to that data. So I'm looking at everybody here, right? But once I add, let's say, employee search, they won't show up in my violations anymore. But one of the users I'm curious about is why Deborah is accessing this data. Why is my DBA using the uh, OCI uh, web SQL console there and accessing some HR data? I'd probably want to ask her. She may have had a, a query that she needed to run for the VP of HR. Okay, cool. And then I would kind of look to see, well, this looks like an acceptable use pattern here. I can see that we're using a JWC thin client. We can see maybe a client identifier. We can see the objects that they're accessing. We can see a lot of information about that session, that context of the session, right, in order to see that. Then what I can do is say, okay, I now know that employee search prod is going to be able to access that data. And for now, I'm not going to narrow it down. You remember before where I said, hey, I want to maybe control where employee search accesses that data? Right now, I'm all, all I'm doing is saying, okay, employee search can access its own data. And then I'm going to flip this from um, simulation to a mandatory realm here. So it's going to be enforced, okay? And then, like I said, if I integrate this with Oracle Data Safe, which is our cloud-based kind of auditing solution, sensitive data discovery solution, um, uh, data masking solution as well. And Marcus, I think Bettina has a presentation on Oracle Data Safe coming up pretty soon, doesn't she? Uh, correct. Yes, uh, on uh, December 19 and 20. Yeah, she's okay. going to be doing two sessions for us. Yeah, so what, three weeks away or something, you can take what you've learned today and then say, okay, data safe, I can see this data. I can see that, you know, an administrator enabled database vault. They created a realm. They added objects to that realm. We can see all of that. Then we can create audit policies to audit our particular realms and everything. So we want to create that. And then when Deborah goes and violates that realm, once it's enforced, I can see that audit data. I can see that at a particular time that I cut off, Deborah, DBA Deborah, went in and violated the realm. She was not supposed to access that data and it blocked her, right? Stopped her from doing it. And I'd probably go ask Deborah, like, hey, Deb, what's, uh, what's going on with you accessing this HR data? And I might razz her for it, right? And I might just, and she's like, I'm sorry, man. I thought I was in dev. I was trying to run this query for developer and I didn't realize I was in production. No worries. Don't let it happen again, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen again, right? And then we get into this uh, access pattern of should the application be able to access the data? So Evil Rich is again thinking, okay, well, I could access that data, right? I could just take that HR user, that employee search schema owner, and I'll go query the data myself. I don't need, uh, I don't need access to it that way. Again, stepping through this, we are going to control that with that rule set we add there, right? We trust the application server. We don't trust um, employee search to be able to log in from Rich's laptop. Once again, kind of all the, all the um, factors that are available there we can utilize. And then what I did was, how I did that was I created this rule set that limited how this could be applied here. So you can see the, the red here, I've said, Employee search, you can authenticate, you can log in, but if you're going to access this realm protected data, you're going to follow the trusted application path that I've written. And if I don't, you're going to get a violation. You're going to say you get a violation, whatever you want it to say. Mine says you cannot use the account this way, the app account this way. Maybe you just want it to be generic, right? Maybe you just want it to be an error message so it doesn't stand out. Maybe you want to be a little more user friendly and you want to say, hey, call the help desk or file a JIRA to request access to whatever this data is, right? We've got that capability there, okay? Same thing uh, here. Um, I don't want to allow truncate to occur. I want to allow 
um, truncate to only occur from my jump servers, my trusted servers, all those kind of things. Again, really pretty simple to get started here. We create a command rule on that truncate table command, and then we apply some logic there that says we trust the jump servers, whatever those IPs or host names are that we've added to our rule set, to, to run the truncate command in the employee search prod schema. Remember, they must have the privilege first. If they don't have the privilege, the database says, get out of here. You don't have the privilege. I'm not going to let you truncate something you don't have the privilege to. If they have the privilege, the privilege says, cool, talk to database vault. <laughs> database vault is going to decide whether or not you have access to that. In this case, maybe I do, right? It's a part of our deployment process. So again, I don't want to stop anybody from doing their job, but I want to control those mistakes that I've made. I want to control malicious or curious activity. I want to control some of those things that we've got going on here. Okay, let's wrap it up here. We got three minutes or so left. We talked about all these things, right? Allow the admins to work, but maybe don't let them access data. Allow the application to function, but maybe don't let that contractor log in with that old password from his laptop. Enforce the company policies and limit human error and mistakes, right? That's what we want to do there. And we've just kind of scratched the surface, right? Uh, I would say the first thing you should do when you spin up an autonomous database is integrate it with uh, Oracle data safe, right? Like get that auditing data, understand where your sensitive data is, then implement database vault, configure, enable, restart, then try to understand like, okay, what would we use here to protect? We've identified sensitive data with data safe. Let's go ahead and put a realm and simulation mode around that data, okay? Don't use admin, please. Um, you can utilize command rules instead of realms if you want. You want to get more granular. Look at those secure application roles for like your break glass account. And then for your backups for your database vault users, you could integrate them with OCI IM as your AD, Kerberos, and centrally managed users. So, hey, if I'm if I'm a DBA, I may get my privileges from the directory service instead of being granted it on 10,000 individual databases, right? We want to manage those privileges at a directory level as opposed to an individual database level. And then get notifications from DataSafe with OCI notifications, right? Deborah tried to access that data, right? I just want to know. I, it's probably okay, but I want to know, okay? If you want to spend more time with me, which I would love to have you, We've got uh, guest speakers as well, so it's not just me, but we've got our database security product managers that meet and we discuss, we cover database security topics on the second Wednesday of every month at 10 a.m. U.S. Central. We've got like four years worth of activity out there, okay? We've got a lot of stuff out there. And um, let me paste the links here. We've got uh, all the links out here. And then um, join us. We've got past recordings. We've got other recordings out there as well. So these are these are the yeah these are the um, the office hours. I'll share these links in the chat as well. Okay. So I've got at least four presentations out there where I've talked about different database vault activities and use cases and everything. And then the other thing that I'd like you to take a look at, and I'll share in the chat as well, is. Not only this lab, but we've got two other database vault labs that kind of talk about how you can use autonomous, uh, either just autonomous database and database vault, or you can do database vault on prem, or kind of the uh, the securing a legacy app idea that I've walked through today. Okay, so lots of good opportunity in order to get your hands on Oracle database vault. The other thing you can do is take a look at live labs and look at our 40 plus database security specific live labs. Most of them you can run on Oracle's dime. Um, two out of the three that I provided you can. Today that legacy app uh, workshop, you can't run on Oracle's dime. I'm working on getting it to where we could just spin it up with a green button and then you could walk through it. It's a work in progress for me, but get your hands on the technology, whether it's Oracle Database, Oracle Database Vault, TDE, whatever it is, we've got so many labs out there for you to utilize, take advantage of, and learn from, okay? All right, my email's on the screen. Feel free to email me, reach out and everything, and uh, kind of see what's going on. 
Marcus, I got one more question. It was in the chat here that I may want to cover. Sure. All right, go ahead. Yeah. So the question was, can you summarize the difference between database vault and data safe? And uh, this is a good one because we have so many products named vault or safe or whatever, right? Key Oracle database vault is that technical control in the database that separates the DBAs from the data and helps protect and reduce malicious or uh, mistakes within the database. Data safe is a, a monitoring tool. So it collects your audit data. It identifies sensitive data. And then for your non-production databases, you can utilize it to mask data. So data safe is kind of a combination of, let's say audit vault and data masking and subsetting, okay? Database vault, right? We are that security guard standing in front of the, the room saying you're not allowed to come in here. Cool. Excellent. All right. That was great. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. So, um, guys, thank you very much again. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, again, some links on uh, the, uh, you know, important links on, on the autonomous database. I'm going to share them again here uh, in the chat so you guys have it. Um, and then uh, final thoughts. Okay, so final thoughts. Basically, you know, you you can go either to the uh, Learning Lounge or to the ADBLL um, main blog, and you're going to see the recordings, the PDF, uh, these links. And on the main blog, I'm adding actually some of the links, for example, that uh, that Rich shared, right? I'm going to be adding those there, all right? Um, so next sessions, um, so uh, we're done with the, the, the um, database vault sessions, right? And then we're going to have the recording for you guys. Next sessions are going to be the MongoDB API. We got an apex on autonomous database, and then we are going to do the data safe. That's going to be our, uh, the end of the year, right? So that last 2023, the final 2023 session. All right. So again, uh, really thank you guys uh, for joining and, and thank you, Rich, again. I'm going to leave uh, this channel open. Uh, if there are any other questions, guys, just type them in into Q&A, okay? So I'll leave this open for now. And... Um, uh, in the meantime, uh, and you know, thank you for joining and and thank you for coming, guys. And uh, I'll see you guys, uh, you know, next week. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rich. Yeah.